You are welcome to today's lecture. I remain Anoe Benjamin Ozana, and I'm here to take an aspect of the course Introductory Codex Zoology. The course code is Zoo 202. In this lecture, I will be emphasizing more on the comparative morphology and anatomy of protocodids. And I assure you that if you follow through to this lecture, you will learn a lot of things about the protocodids. As a way of introduction, the protocodids are an informal assemblage of animals. And the member tags that include some of the earliest or first, hence the name protocodids. So the word proto symbolizes or signifies first. So invariably what we'll be looking at in this uh, course, this aspect of mine, is the codits that existed before the real codits we are still going to study in the future. However, other lecturers will be handling you on this part. But as a way to introduce you to the codex zoology, I want to Ray some of the protocodes we have and then share some facts with you. Another crucial point to note is that the protocodes are not a proper taxonomic group. It was just a collection of convenience where members share some or all five features of the fundamental coded body plan. What I tend to say here is that protocodes can either have all the five features of the coded body plan, or they could have some of the five features of the fundamental coded body plan. So, protocodates are organisms that possesses some or all five features of the fundamental coded body plan. I hope you are still with me. Now you might want to know what are these five features of the five fundamental features of the coded body plan. The five features include one, presence of notochord. Two, presence of pharyngeal slits. Three, endostyle or thyroid gland. Four, position of dosal hollow nerve tube and then finally the presence of post anal tail so any organism that possesses these five features is tagged a codit however we said that protocodit could have some of these five features or they could have all of the five features of a fundamental codate body plan. I hope you got it right. So all protocodates must not have the five features at once. They could have some of them and that's the protocodates. In the next uh, slide now I will be sharing with you some general facts on protocodates and these general facts on protocodates I will recommend you take your note, jot down the points, because in the examination, some of these questions could pop out for you. So take your time to digest these general facts on protocodits. It is very, very important. The first point I want to share with you on the fact is that the anatomy is simple. In other words, they don't have a complicated body structure. And then their phylogenic position is ancient. Another point to note is that all protocodids are marine animals that feed by means of cilia and mucus. So if, for instance, in the examination you see a question like, all protocodids are marine animals, true or false, you should know the answer. Of course, the answer is true. All of them are marine animals. They are not terrestrial. I, can, I could decide to twist the question and say that 
all protocodates are terrestrial animals. That is false, all right? But then also note that these protocodates, they have a way they feed, and it is by the means of cilia and mucus. In subsequent lectures, we shall see how these organisms utilize their cilia and mucus for feeding. Another crucial point to note, or crucial facts to note about the protocodates is that they often live different lives as young larvae than they do as adults. In other words, the way they behave or the way they live at their larval stage differs from the way they live at their adult stage. For instance, their larvae may be pelagic, that is residing in open water between the surface and the bottom. Where wild adults are usually benthic and their lava stage planktonic. Some burrow into the substrate or are sessile and are attached to it. Because of the presence of food, they tend to burrow into their substrate. You know, substrate has to do with the, 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 the food where these protocodes uh, gain nutrients from. So, what they do, they burrow into their substrate and get glued to that substrate, that media, where they have their food in abundance. So that is why we say they could now be sessile and attached to it. Could just be sedentary, remaining at a spot, just because of the presence of food in abundance. Some of these adults of a protocodes are solitary, living alone, while others are colonial and live together in associated groups. So... I could also give you an instance of an exam question saying that all protocodates are solitary. You can see the answer is false. They are not all solitary because we have some that are colonial, whereby they live together in associated groups and that way they survive more. Another crucial fact about protocodates is that some of them are dioecious, that is, they have both the male and female gonads in separate individuals. In other words, we can say that they have male and female. Meanwhile, there are others too that are monoecious, meaning that they have both the male and female gonads in one individual. Remember in the last lecture we had in ZOO 201 where I taught you Atropoda, I also highlighted that Atropos are dioecious. All right, where they have male and females. So for protocodates, know that they are both dioecious and monoecious. Some of them have both male and female gonads in separate individuals, while some have both male and female gonads in the same individual. Their food consists of suspended particles extracted from a stream of water prepared by cilia. So from this point or this fact, you could see with me that the cilia helps in making movement or in propelling water towards their direction. So what happens is that the, the actual food that these protocodes feed on are suspended in the stream of water. So what they now do is that they use their cilia to propel that stream of water to their direction and from there they take their food. Also know that the food particles of protocodates are collected on sheets of mucus and then directed to the gut. So if for example you are asked a question like food particles are collected on dash and directed to the gut of protocodates. I hope you know what to answer. Another crucial fact to note is that the water flowing in with food during feeding of protocodates is diverted outside through lateral pharyngeal slits in order to prevent turbulence that might disturb the carefully gathered mucus called laden with food. So they regulate the water flow. Even humans, when you take too much water, it will not be too safe for you. There, will, there is always room for regulation. That is why if you if you don't know how to swim and you get into a water body, you know, you can get drowned there due to an influx of excess water. 
Remember we said the protocodids are marine animals. In other words, they are always aquatic. So they live in water bodies. So what do they do? They control the flow of water into their body through what they call the lateral pharyngeal slits. Now when present, the notochord, along with tail muscles, is usually part of the locomotor apparatus, giving the animal more mobility than afforded by cilia alone. Why we said when present is because sometimes all the five features of the coded body plan are not present. So what we are saying is for the organisms that have the notochord and the tail muscles, that these two could actually become part of the apparatuses for movement, aside the fact that they use cilia. You know, I already mentioned that cilia can be used for movement by protocodids. However, when they have notochord and tail muscles, it could now augment their movement. It could now be part of their mobility. In this lecture, we shall be focusing more on the living protocodids we have. And there we have the cephalocodids and urocodids. But then, in my own aspect of this course, I will be handling you on the cephalocodids. Another lecturer will teach you the urocodids. So until we meet again in our next lecture, I will recommend that you go over these things again. Practice the, the salient points in this material. Remember, your exams most of the times could be subjectives requiring you to have mastery of the salient points in the material. So what I would recommend is you read in between lines, memorize these things over and over again, and I'm assuring you that you're going to do well in your exams. I wish you all the best. Until our next lecture, keep doing your work, your, doing your, keep doing your part with respect to studying so hard, and I'm assuring you that you will make it Bye.